Hi, I'm Ryan Duffy with Morning Brew, and today we have Toto Wolf, team principal and CEO at Mercedes Formula One. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. So let's start off. You know, congrats are in order for winning the sixth consecutive constructors title. How are you, how are you feeling about that? Yeah, it's, it feels great. Um, six consecutive world championship title hasn't, titles hasn't been done before. Mm -hmm. The um, record stood with Ferrari in right. the Michael Schumacher era. And, uh, and obviously that is, a, that, is a, that is an achievement we are very proud of. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, as we were just talking about, you're also closing in on the driver's championship. You know, you're in a pretty good situation where Hamilton you know, is definitely the favorite and looks like he's, he's going to, to take it soon. But the runner-up, you know, the underdog is uh, Bottas. So you must be feeling good, pretty good about that as well. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's down to our two drivers. Right, um, right. And um, they have um, pushed each other very hard this season. And they obviously, we as Mercedes, we're in a con comfortable position that only one of the two um, is going to win the driver championship as well. Yeah, yeah. Not a, not a bad spot to be in. No, it's a good spot. It feels good. So, you know, let's zoom out a bit. You are, you have a couple of reasons to celebrate. But I know that you've said in past interviews that you really like to not focus on the grand picture of things and you know celebrate but really stay you know focused week to week and are you are you doing that right now you know I know that there is reason to really think about this and celebrate but are you focused on Austin this weekend yeah it's something that we are we are talking uh, talking about a lot we are always the we have the half empty glass um, mindset um, when you when you the joy of winning lasts a very sh is only a very short joy because um, the skepticism about your performance all the shortcomings that you have that you have seen um, um, just come up and um, we are really we are obsessive about about um, our own uh, development and uh, we know that tougher times um, could be on the horizon so we always push each other uh, to the next event and um, and uh, for us as a, as a group and an organization, um, once you decide to call it a day, I think you can look back and say, how many races have we won and how mm -hmm. many uh, great performances have we delivered? But whilst you are in there, it's actually very difficult to, um, to enjoy that. And uh, it's not something we have been particularly good at in the past. Right, right. So let's talk a little bit more about technology. I, you know, write about technology. That's my day-to-day -day job. And I know you were, in a past life, you were a tech investor, as you like to say, in the tech boom of the 90s. And now, you know, you're team boss in a very technologically advanced sport. What percent of your day-to-day -day job are you really thinking about technology and, you know, working with your, your engineers and really thinking what's going under the hood of the car, no pun intended? As you say, my background is um, 20 years in finance and it started um, in the late 90s and early 2000s with technology because this, this was the place to be. But it then shifted into a more uh, traditional bricks and mortar businesses. Mm -hmm. And um, eventually I ended up in, in sports and, right. um, and, and then in an executive function at Mercedes. Um, uh, we have a partnership, um, I have a partnership with Mercedes, we co-own the team which is something that I'm, I'm very proud of. And um, obviously, technology and engineering plays a, la a large role in, in Formula One. We are at the pinnacle of motor racing. Mm -hmm. um, and um, all the things that are, that are coming up beyond the classical engineering, machine learning, and artificial intelligence play a, a very big role in our sport as well. And I, I embrace the challenge in, in, in translating these technologies into our um, sports business. And that is, that is very interesting indeed. Right, so Formula One cars and in the entire operation, it produces a lot of data. Can you talk a little bit more about how artificial intelligence and machine learning fit into the equation and you know, how Mercedes is using it specifically? Yeah, we are um, almost 2,000 people, mostly engineers, that, um, that deploy two cars um, mm -hmm. on, on, on the track. And um, our cars, cars would run on any, on any other race weekend about 500 different sensors and data channels yeah. and um, it's, it, is, it, it becomes a challenge to dissect um, these channels, filter the important information in order to 
uh, tune the car in that very limited amount of time. And that is something that, um, that is um, um, a real technology battle that we have. We are very happy to have great partners on board that help us um, in these areas and has been something that um, I believe was a differentiator between us, some mm -hmm. us and some of the other teams. Right. So sticking with this tech theme and focusing on racing, to what extent are you using all of this data and you know, in-season strategy for improving the car as you go versus planning for the next season's car? Um, both are equally important. Um, what you see on a race weekend is just the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. It's about utilizing the, the tool that's been given to you or the product tu and tuning it. Um, most of the performance is being made in the factories in the, in the United Kingdom where uh, we're looking very far ahead. Right. So for example, next year's car is already, is already done. Um, uh, we know what it, what it will be. The um, launch specification um, is almost finished. So um, the factories would normally start a year early um, on, the, on the project and then it will be taken over um, by the um, uh, race uh, uh, race engineering and they will deploy and tune the, the product. Okay. To what extent as Team Boss do you rely on all of this, these data streams versus you know trust your driver and trust your gut and trust your, your you know human instincts? Um, I think that uh, you need to have the best set of information mm -hmm. um, to make an educated decision. Right. There is, we have the permanent discussion with, with our very engineer-heavy uh, yeah. structure, how much psychology and gut actually mm -hmm. uh, plays a role in the decision-making process. And um, I think it plays a role. Uh, my, particularly, my particular contribution to the teams um, on, on the race weekends, trying to look at all the information that I am getting from our senior engineering leadership that is purely data-based Right. and give it um, 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 a psychological um, s um, thought, um, um, a, a common sense approach uh, whilst deploying it with the racing drivers. Because you must not forget we have this um, unbelievable high-tech machine, yeah. um, but there is a human inside. And mm -hmm. the, the engineers would say, well, the, the weakness of the car lies between the steering wheel and the engine, mm -hmm. uh, irrational behavior good and bad days, um, emotions. And so it is very much about extracting the optimum performance between this machine, with the car, right. and the human in the car, and mm -hmm. then all the support network around the strategists that are humans um, in order to have a successful race. Right, right. And obviously, you're not just, the car isn't just steering itself, you know, you have uh, Hamilton and, and Botas, who are obviously world-class world drivers. So specifically during race day and planning the strategy for pitting and what tires you use, to what extent is that shaped by data versus race day conditions versus driver feedback again? We've made the simulation where an autonomous car tuned to the maximum of the what is available technologically today would be able to compete with the driver and we're not even close yeah we're speaking about five s seconds in difference in lap time that the best machine would probably um, um, be able to come near driver right so the, the best of the driver still make the very very much of a difference and again there <coughs> there's a crossover between technology and the human data will be utilized to find out how hot we can um, uh, run the tire how much pressure it needs to have, how we are preparing the tire, how we are tuning the car in terms of toe, camber, um, ride height, uh, roll stiffness in order to have the, the quickest possible car. But it still needs the driver inside of the car to drive it. Yeah. And um, many drivers will have different driving styles. Some like a car that is, that is loose on the rear. Others prefer a car that understeers. Mm -hmm. so, um, you, can, you can put the same car to two different drivers and they will have very different feedback. One is going to like it and go fast and the other one is going to struggle. So this interaction, human and technologies, is, is again also in, in, in whilst driving the car very important. Yeah, in, in technology you talk a lot about 
personalization, and I guess I've never really thought about you know, Formula One and making the car work for the driver, but it seems like that, that's what you're saying to yes. a certain extent. I mean, in technology, when you, when you look at data, for example, and the impact it, it can have, and um, we've heard a great keynote yesterday from um, uh, Charlie, the CEO of one of our partners, Pure, Pure Technology, and, um, and it's how, how things have changed in, in, in the, the amount of data you're able to generate about your customer to understand better about his preferences and tune, in a way, right. the offer to him so he's, he has a, a wider range of um, interesting, interesting offers. It's a little bit the same with us. Um, at the end, it's about understanding what the driver needs, uh, what kind of tool we have to give to him, how we have to um, develop it, um, how, we, how, we, how we can tune it on the racetrack so he can then execute um, and, and uh, contribute with his best performance. Okay, okay. So a lot of technologies are developed for you know, a premium segment or they're very expensive at the beginning and then costs drop and eventually they diffuse widely into society. What, in your time at the helm of Mercedes, what do you think some of Formula One's greatest contributions to, let's say, the auto sector more broadly have been? Formula One was always a lo laboratory for um, um, car companies. And when you look at the things that we take for granted today, um, ABS, power assisted mm -hmm. um, steering, uh, traction control, that is, that these are all technologies that have been developed in a Formula One race car to optimize its lap time. Today, um, uh, traction control will help you on a slippery, slip, slippery surface. ABS has contributed massively to reduce the amount of accidents mm -hmm. that we have. You are able, you can brake, um, and you're still able to steer the car. So you can see that these technologies that were developed in order to just optimize a racing car's performance have actually found their way into road cars and have, um, have massively advanced the technology. Yeah, yeah. You know, at one point they were in 20 cars, now they're in hundreds of millions of cars. Absolutely. Um, and and the, these three that I mentioned are maybe obvious ones, but there's so much more um, pedal shifting for example, <coughs> seamless, um, seamless shifting in, uh, in gearboxes. Right. All these things have been developed in Formula One. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk a little bit about electrification. That is where the auto industry, I'd say, more broadly is heading, slowly but surely. And you talk about racing, you know, there's, there's Formula E, and I know that your wife is a team principal in, uh, at Venturi Racing. What do you think the future of how will, that, how will that future impact Formula One racing specifically? I think you need to differentiate between the um, uh, sport that needs to provide entertainment value and um, what's happening on the, on the road every day. Yeah. Nevertheless, everything around emissions and sustainability has become a core topic also in our sport. So as a matter of fact, in Formula One, we run the most efficient hybrid power units on the planet. We have more than 50% thermal efficiency. That means more than 50% of everything we put into the car in order to um, uh, propel the car um, is, being, um, <coughs> is being utilized for energy. And um, in the same way, Formula E, the electric race series, is very important for us. Um, because battery technology plays a role there. Right. So we are excited um, on, on in contributing with uh, our fast laboratory, the ele purely electric car, and the hybrid car that is Formula One in order to um, deploy uh, sustainable um, and efficient um, uh, power units into the road mm -hmm. cars. Okay, so speaking of efficiency, we are at the NASDAQ in the financial capital of the world. Obviously, being a Formula One team isn't cheap. How do you, as CEO and team principal, how do you ensure that you know, you're running operations as effectively as possible while also delivering you know, maximum returns? And I know that that's not an easy thing to calculate beyond winning a lot, but yeah, I was wondering to get your thoughts on that. Um, like most of the other, um, professional sports leagues. Formula One um, in, in itself is a, is a big business. 
and um, we as, a, as a, a racing team we are we are contributing with advertising value mm -hmm. for our partners um, um, that is eyeballs uh, formula one generates around two billion views every year uh, uh, more than 90 million every single weekend right. um, uh, globally with a live race attendance of almost 200,000 and we as a team we operate on about half a billion dollars in budget uh, but almost break even and um, the aim certainly in the near future <coughs> with um, um, certain regulatory uh, uh, topics kicking in like a cost cap that is something that is pretty well understood in the US yeah. but not um, in Europe <laughs> um, uh, kicking in uh, so our business cases are just about to turn into profitability um, in the next uh, two years and that is obviously exciting apart from the big marketing platform that you're able to provide also um, to have a healthy business model for the shareholders of the of these um, um, 10 racing teams great so looking ahead this weekend we have circuit of americas in austin texas and we were talking a bit before about your opinions on the track and what you know what this means for u.s expansion because i know you Formula One would love to beef up its presence in the United States. So I was hoping you could tell me a bit more about how you're feeling about this weekend and then, you know, more broadly about what, what an expansion in the U.S. might look like. The U.S. is a very important market for us as Mercedes. It's an important market, but overall as, a, as a, um, sports consumers, it's a really important market. Uh, Formula One um, has a, um, a majority of American owners, American shareholders um, with Liberty Media and that is something that was really good for us to grow our audiences and the interest in the US. Um, Austin has been very good to us. Um, they took a lot of risk by, 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 by taking uh, Formula One many years ago and it's a race that, is, that has become uh, part of the calendar. Um, uh, nevertheless, uh, we would very much hope that we can expand the calendar into uh, more cities uh, in the U.S. Obviously, New York, um, or Manhattan would yeah. be fantastic. Las Vegas, Miami, then maybe a race on the on the West Coast. And this is something the uh, management is looking looking into. And and hopefully, when we sit here in five or six years, we will have another two or three races in the U.S. and 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 grow the audiences in the in the U.S. as well. And maybe one day, right out here, they'll be driving by. I think right probably not here. Times Square, but. Well, why not? Uh, um, um, uh, I think if we were to race in Manhattan, um, uh, I'm sure that we would um, tap the audiences that are interested in this in, in, in that sport. Uh, and um, and uh, yeah, I can I can see it racing around here. All right, great. Well, thanks for chatting. Thank Appreciate it, and good luck next weekend. Thank you.